I thought it'd be fun to get into the Halloween spirit a little bit earlier this year by talking about ghosts or more specifically by talking about ghost writers because what if I told you that the biggest selling book of 2023 so far wasn't written by the author on its cover or that the fastest selling debut novel of all time in the UK wasn't either and neither were some books that we consider to be cult classics. Should we even talk about when this book happened, the Kylie and Kendall Jenner book Rebels City of Indra and if you're wondering did anyone actually read that book? Yes, some of us did. <laughs> and we're still recovering. Did they even read this book? I'm not sure. Or what if I told you that this book, which is currently number two in the UK bestseller charts, was not written by the author on its cover? And that is because all of these books I just mentioned were written by ghostwriters. According to the Cambridge English Dictionary, a ghostwriter is someone who writes a book or article, etc., for another person to publish under his or her own name. And in the celebrity world, this is very, 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 very common, perhaps more common than Ozempic at this point. And so I wanted to do a little deep dive into it. I want to talk about why ghostwriting inherently feels like an injustice to us as an audience, why it's different between fiction and non-fiction. I also want to talk about the general ethics of ghostwriting and it may surprise you to know that actually I think that celebrity books are one of the most important parts of the publishing industry, but maybe not for the reason that you expect. So I will get on to talking about all of that throughout this video. So grab a snack and let's chat. Frankly, ghostwriting is something that has always happened and will continue to happen. In fact, scholars are questioning whether Homer even wrote the Iliad. But every now and then, public awareness of ghostwriting and questions about the ethics of ghostwriting bubble back up to the surface. And because this is such a case-by-case -case thing, it is always kind of weaponized against one individual, usually in order to undermine and discredit them and their work. And that is kind of what's happening to Millie Bobby Brown right now. Debut novel by Millie Bobby Brown reignites debates over ghost-written celebrity books, reports The Guardian. Because last week, this book, 19 Steps, was published by HarperCollins. It's a story set during World War II about an often forgotten tragedy in Bethnal Green in London. So basically, during the Blitz and when there were air raids, people would obviously need to shelter from the risk of bombs. Specific air raid shelters were created, but in a busy city like London, there wasn't always space for each person to have their own bunker. And so the London underground tube stations were used as a place where lots of people could get shelter. This was an effort to protect people in the city. So Bethnal Green is a part of London. And in the Bethnal Green tube station, there were 19 steps. 19 steps going down from street level underground to the station. Now, these 19 steps were really dark. There was no banister. It was not very safe. And the local council had been campaigning to the government to get funding to make this safer, to add lighting, to add a railing so people could hold on as they descended the stairs. But they got nothing back. The government said this was not a priority. Then one day the alarms were sounded. People hurried to the tube station. And as one person got down to the bottom steps, they tripped and fell. The person behind them tripped and fell as well. And you've got to imagine this is a country at war. This is a capital city that is being bombed. So when the air raid sirens are going off, people are panicking. Everyone is trying to get underground as quickly as they possibly can. It's dark. There's no banister. People can't really see. There's nowhere to cling onto. And so people just started to fall on top of each other. And it literally was building up and up. You can imagine how confusing and scary and chaotic this would have been. And unfortunately, 173 people lost their lives in this incident. People were literally crushed and suffocated by other human bodies. It was a horrible and sad and avoidable tragedy and one that Millie Bobby Brown's grandmother Ruth was present for and survived. And so Millie came up with the concept of this book in her honor. It's kind of giving Joanne <laughs> by Lady Gaga. And so I read it. To be honest with you, the writing style is a little cliche. It opens with a description of the weather, like it's <laughs> a 10 year old's creative writing project. It was a bright Saturday in September that felt as though it was still summer. It was hot, the kind of heat that makes you long for the weather to cool down and the leaves to fall, but when you berated yourself for wishing away the good weather. You know, it was the kind of heat that was hot, the kind of water that was wet, the kind of food that was edible, the kind of clothes that you wear. Honestly, I put someone else's name on the cover of this book just so people didn't think I'd written it. The first 150 pages are incredibly dull. It's just a very typical family, a very typical war novel, a very typical love story. It's nothing you haven't already read before. And then the stairs thing happens. And honestly, it was a bit of a page turner at that point. I will not lie to you. Then at the end of the book, there is a frankly absurd <laughs> plot twist, which I don't want to spoil, but it really is. Um, it was a choice. The choices were made. 
none of them good. It feels like the research for this novel was just like kind of what you vaguely recollect from studying the war in school, with maybe one quick skim read of Wikipedia, just for good measure. I think the strategy here was like, if we mention the word rationing on every page, then maybe no one will question us on historical accuracy. Overall, it's a story of love and family and moving on, or at least coexisting with a tragedy. There are devastating scenes, like I said, there are page turning moments. And the overall tone of the book is one of hope and recovery. As a story, it's pretty harmless. It's not gonna change the world, but it does shed light on this tragedy, which, you know, I think is what Millie Bobby Brown set out to do. And it's safe to say that this book has been met with some mixed reviews, shall we say. The Telegraph says, read her debut and weep. Some say there's nothing this young star can't do, but her first book, 19 Steps, a flat and repetitive wartime romance disproves that. If someone wrote that about me, <laughs> the ghost writer would not be the only ghost. There would also be my own. I would be deceased, <laughs> I would evaporate. That would be the death of my ego, Jesus. But honestly, through reading this book, I think it is so obvious that it was not written by a 19 year old. So blindingly obvious, Stevie Wonder could see it. The old fashioned themes it's concerned with, the language it uses, the way the love story plays out, in a way that romanticizes traditional values, like nothing about this feels contemporary or modern. And that's not to say that historical fiction has to feel modern or it has to feel contemporary, but I think World War II novels like this are a broken record at this point. It's been done, so we wanna see something innovative and exciting, and this isn't that. It's also not to say that Gen Z people can't Write historical fiction because they absolutely can. If anything, I would encourage it. A young mind could have, should have, would have brought something new to the genre, and yet this doesn't really do anything. And yet there is one rather large Gen Z name on the cover of this book. That's marketing, baby. When we open the cover up, we have Millie Bobby Brown's name again. And then beneath it, if you squint really hard and crane your neck in a little bit, oh, there it is, with Kathleen McGurl. It's more like Millie Bobby Brown with Kathleen McGurl. There's the ghostwriter, but look, she's there, she's credited. Often you won't find a ghostwriter's name until you get to like the acknowledgements of the book. In fact, let's see <laughs> what's in here. Usually they'll say something like, thank you for helping me bring my story to life. Where is the reference? Here we go. And to the brilliant Kathleen McGurl for working with me to bring it to life. <laughs> Every time! If I had a pound for every time someone credited their ghostwriter like that, I'd be able to afford one. But I guess this begs the question, are we really surprised? You know, a celebrity using a ghostwriter... Stranger things have happened. You knew there'd be a Stranger Things part in there somewhere. Now, Millie actually posted a picture of her and Kathleen together. On the release date on Instagram, she posted a huge thank you to my collaborator at Kathleen McGurl. I couldn't have done this without you. Hashtag 19 steps. So let's be clear about one thing. This ghostwriter is not being hidden. And I should also mention that Kathleen was also mentioned in the announcements of this book back in March because <laughs> the cynical skeptic inside me was like, I wonder if they're just kind of covering this up. I wonder if they're kind of covering their tracks now by posting about the ghostwriter. Now there's been backlash, but in Millie's defense, they've been posting about this ghostwriter since the very, very beginning of this campaign. It was not a last minute panic. They've been tagging her since the beginning, but some people were still pretty outraged, taking to the comment section on Millie's post to say, you mean she wrote it for you and you're taking the credit? So you can become an author and not actually write it yourself these days. What's the point? Someone even said, just use chat GPT next time. And I noticed that Barnes and Noble had to actually turn the comments off on their post promoting Millie's book because there was so much backlash in the comment section. All this begs the question, how much of this book did Millie Bobby Brown actually write? And it kind of turns out, not a lot. Essentially, the idea behind the story was hers. But Kathleen McGurl took to her blog to explain the collaboration process, saying, I was sent a lot of research that had already been pulled together by Millie and her family and plenty of ideas and we had a couple of Zoom calls. And then I knuckled down and wrote the first draft, while Millie continued sending more ideas via WhatsApp. The book went through several drafts since then as we refined the story. So are a couple of Zoom calls, some WhatsApp messages, and a few edits enough to warrant having your name on the cover, in capital letters, in gold foil, no less, when your ghostwriter doesn't even get silver foil, not even bronze, not even the bold at all. She's lucky she even got capital letters <laughs> on her name. She's lucky it was printed in black ink, not white. <laughs> I'm kidding, I am kidding. I honestly think that Millie has been pretty transparent about this whole thing. A quick glance inside the book, a quick Google search will reveal that this was a collaboration. Although of course, like all celebrities, she never uses the word ghostwriter. So why does it still just feel a little bit Icky. I suppose what feels uncomfortable to us as consumers, like something that I sort of found a bit 
distasteful. Is seeing Millie Bobby Brown selling out venues in London, doing book signings, gleefully signing copies of a book that she didn't write. Something about that just doesn't sit right, I guess. And I actually thought that this big show that she did at the Hackney Empire, that live event could have been the perfect opportunity to sit on a stage with her collaborator and discuss the creation process of the book. But I have to be realistic too and know that it's Millie Bobby Brown's name that is selling tickets. You know, that's who people have come to see. They want to hear her. They want to hear her story. They want to hear her responses to questions because they are fans of her. And if you really wanted a detailed book club discussion about the craft of writing and the art of literature, you would go and see a literary fiction writer. I do sometimes think that when people discuss these events and the abstract idea of the paying consumer, they talk about them like they're a bit stupid, as if people don't know what they're paying for, what they're getting themselves into on an individual level, when really those people who bought tickets bought tickets because of the star power of Millie Bobby Brown. They wanted to hear her speak. They won't have been going expecting Jane Austen. I think what's important to put into perspective here is that sometimes when we think of ghostwriting, we think of it as a kind of injustice, as if someone else spent years working on a book and then a celebrity like Millie Bobby Brown just came and pinched it out of their hands. Like the perception we have of author ghostwriter relationships is almost like someone sitting doing their homework and then the cool kid in class coming over and like stealing their answers and saying them louder and getting all the credit for them. Getting a big fat gold star while the person who actually wrote the answers is left in the dust with nothing. But what we have to remember is that ghost writers know what they're getting themselves into. They sign up for these projects. They are commissioned to do this. They do so of their own free will. They know exactly what the rollout of the book will entail. I know that it feels like some kind of injustice, but it's crucial to remember that ghostwriting is a profession that writers willingly sign up for to get their name out there, to make sure that their next book deal is bigger, to have a project to work on, and ultimately to make money. They are paid for their work. Often they'll also receive a commission from the royalties of the book. So this is still beneficial for them. They're likely to sell a lot more copies when a celebrity's name is put on the cover and therefore make money. So let's be clear, Millie Bobby Brown is not exploiting her ghostwriter, and we need to forget that narrative. I suppose the big question is, was she exploiting her fans? Personally, I think it's been made very, very clear that this was a collaboration, and maybe these situations just prove that we have to be a little bit more vigilant and maybe assume ghostwritten until proven innocent when it comes to celebrity books. So why bother? How did Millie Bobby Brown even end up having a book with her name on it. My guess would be that 19 Steps is being lined up to be a film starring Millie. I did actually listen to the audiobook of this, which she narrated, and genuinely the character of Nellie, who is the main character in this book, was written for her. Nellie's name is even spelt with an IE, like Millie, Nellie, it, it's so similar. The love interest is even called Bobby. I am not making this up. Now what's interesting to me is that Millie also released a perfume the same week that this book was released. And the treatment of that product has been totally different, different gravy. And I think that's because we kind of implicitly know that when a celebrity puts their name on a perfume, they were not in the lab, goggles on, creating it. I don't think anyone has the impression that Billie Eilish or David Beckham or Jennifer Lopez are doing all of the chemistry that is involved in creating a fragrance. They just smell them and approve them. Maybe they don't even do that. We also know that Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo are not individually designing each piece of their merchandise. And maybe that's because traditionally perfumes and clothing ranges are released by companies and then endorsed by celebrities. We kind of know that that's a collaborative process. We rarely think of those things as individual ventures. So why does it feel different when it comes to books? Because it does just feel inherently different, right? When a celebrity's name is plastered on a book versus on a perfume. I think maybe it's because we think of writing as something that anyone can do to a certain extent, right? Like, if you put me in a lab and said make a fragrance, I could not do that. But tell anyone to sit down and write a story and they could come up with something. And so I think we think of writing more as a personal labor of love. And we're used to hearing authors talk about how they really labored over a piece of work, over a project for years, maybe it got rejected a lot of times. Then it took one person who really believed in them and now we have the book that we can read. And I think we have this impression of kind of like the troubled, struggling artist. And of course, so much hard work and labor and 
individual effort goes into things like fragrances and fashion design. I'm not saying that it doesn't, but I think this is all about perception and the way that we perceive the concept of the writer as a figure and how we kind of venerate them and celebrate them. I think because the art of writing is considered to be very soul bearing and such an intimate, vulnerable thing that it just doesn't necessarily sit right finding out that someone else's outpouring of creativity has someone else's name slapped on the cover and that someone else is claiming it as their own. I think this is all about perception. But responding to Millie's backlash, a ghostwriter called Shannon Kyle, who founded the Ghostwriters Agency, told The Guardian that it was part of the celeb culture to front products such as perfume, clothing ranges, beauty lines, and food products that celebrities might not have been involved in the technical side of creating. Brown's transparency about her use of a ghostwriter was refreshing, added Kyle, and it doesn't diminish her involvement because ultimately it is her family story and it wouldn't be happening without her. I think that's a crucial detail too. This story would not have come into existence without Millie Bobby Brown's participation in it. It's not like this story would have been published independently by Kathleen if Millie had not been involved in the project. Like This would not have existed at all. Now talking about a service that will do all of the hard work for you, I am buzzing to let you know that today's video is very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. Now Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for building your perfect dream website or online brand. And they do all of the difficult bits for you. So you can bring your vision to life. So you do not need any coding experience or web developer experience. You don't have to hire a ghost web developer. Squarespace have literally hundreds of incredible templates which you can customize and make your own. And there's great features like a blogging feature. There are also really great analytical tools so you can see what an audience is responding well to and therefore make more of that content. And I think it's great. So if you would like to have a play around and see what you can do with Squarespace, you can actually get a free trial over on their website. So head to squarespace.com for that. And then when you're ready to launch your beautiful new website, you can use the code Jack Edwards at squarespace.com slash Jack Edwards to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So you lucky sausage, you're welcome. Launch that website today, maybe for your new ghostwriting business, I don't know. And thank you so, so much to Squarespace for working with me on this video. And this certainly isn't the first time that we've seen outrage over a piece of celebrity ghostwritten fiction. And I do think it's worth pointing out here that this always seems to flare up and rear its ugly head and become a point of public discourse when a successful young woman does it and becomes the target of that outrage. Unfortunately, there is a definite trend of people using ghostwritten books to knock down successful young women, knock them down peg and suggest that they actually don't deserve their success or that they're not self-made, which we put so much emphasis on in our capitalist society. Like the idea of being self-made is the best thing you can possibly be. And no one is a better example of this than Zoe Sugg. In 2014, Zoe, known online as Zoella, released her debut novel, Girl Online. And this quickly became the fastest selling debut novel of all time in the UK. It shifted 78,000 copies in its first week, which is huge for fiction. And it's also worth noting that all pre-order sales count towards first week sales. So because Zoe was already someone in the public eye, she had 7 million followers at the time, she had an avid fan base. That is why she was able to sell so many copies in week one. And in doing so, she usurped the likes of JK Rowling and E.L. James. And so this brought a lot of mainstream media attention to this online star. The Independent note that the honeymoon phase following this success was short lived as speculation began over whether the 26 year old was the book's sole author. So much speculation was beginning to brew online that her publishers, Penguin, had to release a statement. A few days after the speculation started, they said, the factual accuracy of the matter is simply that Zoe Sugg did not write Girl Online on her own. For her first novel, Girl Online, Zoe has worked with an expert editorial team to help her bring to life her characters and experiences in a heartwarming and compelling story. The book was in fact written in collaboration with YA author Siobhan Curran. The Washington Post note that Zoe was deluged with messages from disappointed fans. Some called her a fraud. After all, the appeal of Sug and the crux of her YouTube stardom, she has more than 6.7 million subscribers, lies in the premise that she is an organic, self-made celebrity. And I think that's why Zoella kind of became the face of this. Because we'd already seen people like Katie Price and Naomi Campbell and the Kardashians and the Jenners releasing very obviously ghostwritten books. But I think in those instances, we kind of assumed that they would have had some help. Whereas Zoe kind of initially found her fame through blogging. She was one of the original bloggers. And of course that is a type of writing, a very different type of writing, but a type of writing nonetheless. And again, this is all about perception. People thought 
she would be able to write. When we think of Katie Price and Naomi Campbell and the Kardashians, we sort of think about them in a voyeuristic sense. Like, they have granted us access to their lifestyles that we would not have access to otherwise. On the other hand, we have Zoella, who was living a life that was kind of supposed to be like ours. The charm of what she did is that it seemed attainable. I mean, you could literally see her holding the camera like this. And so the idea of having someone working for you, the idea of having someone doing the job for you, doesn't align with the narrative and the perception that we have of her. I think at this point she was daily vlogging, like people really, really felt that they knew her life. And so I guess to find out that there was something that had sort of been hidden felt like a betrayal of sorts. It felt like dishonesty. And there's definitely a very specific type of anger that people feel, that audiences feel, when an online creator lets them down. I think that's because there's almost this unwritten contract of like, we made you. We gave you everything you have, therefore we can take it away again. Her success was built on the basis that she was relatable and having a ghostwriter isn't relatable. And for her young fans, I think it will also have been the first time they were exposed to the idea of a ghostwriter at all. Maybe it's because people think that either she or her publishers have been manipulative and cynical, said the BBC's Will Gompertz. But if that's the case, they join a very long line of artists who claim to do work that others have actually done on their behalf. I wonder if the problem is with us and not the artist and his or her collaborator. Maybe we are the fakes. We're happy to love the work if we think it's done by the person we admire, but if it proves not to be, then we suddenly dismiss it. Ever since the Renaissance, we've lived in an age of the individual, a philosophical change that's become an obsession nowadays. I guess we do just fundamentally love the idea of the artist as a figure. And as an individual, we allow certain people to earn way more money than us very publicly because we perceive them to be special and to have a talent. And to find out that someone else was sort of propping them up doesn't align with that. It feels untruthful. It feels like that person doesn't deserve to be achieving more than we are. Because hey, maybe if we all had access to all of those resources, we would be the one making all the money and we would be the one being successful. I also think that a crucial part of this story is the fact that this all came to public attention after Zoe had already sold all of these copies and was being celebrated and heralded for her success. And maybe that's what made it feel like there was an element of deception, especially because the ghostwriter was not themselves a debut novelist. So when we say fastest selling debut novel of all time, it kind of feels like that's not actually very accurate. It feels like someone else getting the glory for a ghostwriter's work. And there wasn't that transparency that Millie Bobby Brown seems to have displayed from day one. And I honestly think that Zoe was kind of someone that people learn a lesson from. An article in The Ghostwriter by Siobhan Curran, who actually wrote this book, said, I love writing books and I love helping others write books. And I especially love being involved in the creation of books that help others. Books that deal with real and serious issues such as cyberbullying, homophobia, and anxiety. Books like Girl Online. She also noted how important it was that this book was pumping money into the industry. An industry that she loves, that I love, that hopefully you love, the publishing industry. And that is, I think, maybe the most important point. Celebrity books make money. Even if you hate them, they are a necessary evil for the publishing industry because it pumps money into it. It pumps money into bookstores, into publishing houses. They can also get people who aren't currently into reading to go out and buy a book because they're into the celebrity who wrote it and reading one good book can genuinely make you a reader for life. It's just about flexing that muscle and getting back into the habit of reading. And so if celebrities like these can do that, I'm all here for it. One thing I definitely hear a lot of people say is this opportunity could have gone to someone else. This opportunity could have gone to a debut author who they need to take a risk on. And my rebuttal to that would be that these celebrity books that are guaranteed to make money are vital for the publishing industry. They are vital for ensuring that publishing houses make money. Celebrity books are not risky because they know they will make money, whereas debut novels by unknown authors are. Guaranteed money from celebrity books means that publishing houses can take risks on debut novelists. This is a business that needs to generate profit and they can do that by funding celebrity books, which make back their money and then some, and that, and then some, 
can be given to a debut novelist. The narrative is often, oh look at this privileged celebrity taking away an opportunity from someone who has actually worked for it. But I don't see it that way. I think it's a more complicated ecosystem than we're maybe giving it credit for. The celebrity in the celebrity book is now contributing to that ecosystem, which means there's more money in the industry and in turn more authors can have a chance taken on them. And Siobhan Curram celebrated this with Zoe's book. 2014's fastest selling book, which is currently sitting on top of the UK official top 50 for the second week straight, meant that bookstores such as Waterstones are ending the year on healthy profits, and that Penguin and many other publishers around the world are now able to afford to offer more unknown writers book deals. There's also excitement around the act of reading, which is all we can ask for. And honestly, Girl Online is pretty decent. It's got a good story, it's compelling, but after the scandal of Girl Online, Zoe said that she would write the follow-up books in this series herself, and in more recent years she published this series of books which actually have her collaborator's name on the title. So she definitely said, you're not getting me again. No way. And honestly, Zoe, protect your peace. <laughs> I respect it. And two names on the cover is something that we have started to see more and more. A notable example is the very, very highly successful author, James Patterson. He publishes something like 27 books per year. The only person more productive than that is Taylor Swift. But actually, maybe that's not the truth, Ellen, because if you look at the covers of his books, almost all of them have a co-writer's name on them. Granted, they are slightly smaller than James Patterson's name, because James Patterson is the one who is selling the books, but they are there. And the Washington Post did this really interesting interview with him where they sort of started to unpick a little bit how he does this. And it turns out that these books are not really written by James Patterson. Written is not the precise verb. Conceived, outlined, co-written, and curated. Patterson delivers exhaustive notes and outlines, sometimes running 80 pages, to co-authors. His printer regularly discharging collaborators' efforts, like lottery tickets. As of 2021, he had published over two hundred novels, and Investor's Business Daily report that he has sold over 400 million copies of his books worldwide. That is madness. But again, it's pumping money into the industry. And essentially these books have become part of the James Patterson brand. And that's almost like a brand that you buy into because you can expect a certain style of novel, a certain style of writing from. These books are kind of like the books that your dad buys in the airport, you know? And it kind of turns out that though the ideas for these books may have come from James Patterson's head, they're kind of written by someone else. And that seems to sort of just been widely accepted by the public. And I'm wondering what the difference is here. Maybe because we see James Patterson as someone who has earned his stripes, as someone who has published so many of his own books that now he is entitled to do this. Again, I kind of give him a free pass just because of how much money it generates. I personally wouldn't read these books, but I am grateful to anyone who does because it means that I get the books that I want to read. And I will note that although readers don't seem to care too much, some people in the publishing industry have been very shady about this. Stephen King, in particular, has been quite critical and said that Patterson is a terrible writer, but he's very successful, which is like the biggest <laughs> backhanded compliment. In fact, that's not a compliment. That's just backhanded. And apparently, James Patterson planned to respond to Stephen King by writing a book where a character murders Stephen King, but this book was cancelled, potentially because Stephen King already wrote a book where someone tries to murder Stephen King. It is literally called Misery. But anyway, <laughs> I was living for that beef. And Danielle Steele is another top writer who has published hundreds of books, and on her website, she responded to ghostwriting claims pretty indignantly, shall we say. This is what she said. As some of you know, from reading my blogs on a variety of subjects, I've reacted with amazement, shock, and outrage when people have asked me in my fan mail, who writes my books? Who writes my books? Are you kidding? Who do you think writes my books? As I hover over my typewriter for weeks at a time, working on a first draft with unbrushed hair in an ancient nightgown with every inch of my body aching after typing 20 or 22 hours a day at a stretch. Danielle, <laughs> 22 hours a day? Who are you kidding? Who are you trying to convince? The lady doth protest too much, I think. Although I, I do believe her. I think she's just exaggerating. That's who writes my books, me. And in recent years, I've discovered from my agent and publisher that it has become common practice for some very well-known successful authors to write the outline for a book and hand it over to a team of writers to write the book. Holy sh... 
How do they do that? Both the author and the elves. <laughs> James Patterson Shade is real, by the way. But she does go on to speak about the importance of editors. Writing without a good editor is like dressing in the dark. You come out looking a mess and so does the book. Carol has been editing my books for almost 32 years. She is a genius. Our work together is like a dance, sometimes like tennis or ping pong, and sometimes like ballet, with incredible harmony of thought. And I do think it's worth noting here the crucial role that editors play in working on a book, and that book writing is a collaborative process but it's not the same as having a ghostwriter. I often see that when celebrities especially reference their editors, people are very quick to be like, oh, so the editor did all the work. And that's not really the case. An editor is someone who cares about the book just as much as you do, and they can work as a soundboard and as a feedback machine, and someone who will push you and challenge you and question you and come up with ideas as well, because they want the book to be as good as it can be. And so they give their feedback accordingly, but books are always a kind of collaborative process, and I think that we should understand that. Although in researching for this book, I did find out that some classic books actually have had ghostwriters. For example, I found out that Alexander Dumas, who wrote The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers, did so with a co-author who isn't really credited except on his tombstone, which I feel doesn't really count. There's also the Nancy Drew series of books, which has been going on for like 88 years. And this is actually created by a selection of ghostwriters who all publish under one name, Caroline Keane. And this apparently is called book packaging. And this is a practice in the publishing world where a bunch of different writers come together under one pseudonym and they're contracted to write books in the series all with the same kind of Bible of characters and tone of voice and settings. So essentially they've created this fictional world and then all of these different ghost writers write within it, which I thought was really interesting. There's also the case of Robert Ludlum who writes the Jason Bourne series of books, which has also been made into a film franchise now he actually died in 2001 and yet the Jason Bond books continued being released all the way up to 2017 because after he died ghostwriters took over because the book series was so lucrative and so even in traditional publishing it is sometimes confusing to know when a book has actually been written by the original author I think when it comes to celebrities it's sometimes there's a bit of murkiness because of course there are exceptions to the rule. Some celebrities do write their own fiction. Richard Osman is a popular TV show host here in the UK and his books are at the number one of every bestseller list every week. He's written an enormously successful series called The Thursday Murder Club and by all accounts, he wrote them himself. So sometimes you can sort of tell from the media around the person, the way that the person talks about the process of creating the book, whether they had assistance or not. But everything we've spoken about up to this point has been fiction. And in the fiction world, in that landscape, we kind of assume that people would write their own books. But the other side of the coin is non-fiction, where we don't necessarily think that. When it comes to memoir writing and autobiographies, I think we actually assume the opposite. I think we assume that they did have help with those books. When a celebrity releases an autobiography, there's an implicit understanding that they probably didn't write it, says novelist Aisha Malik, who has worked as a ghostwriter. And I really think this is true. Like, Britney Spears just signed one of the most lucrative, biggest book deals of all time. Her book is coming out next month, but I think we all are assuming that she won't have written it. I don't think any of us for a second thought that Britney Spears was writing that book. I mean, we've all seen her Instagram captions. They are not necessarily coherent. I love her to pieces, but a book written like her Instagram captions would be illegible. They're basically incoherent ramblings. That book would be like an acid trip if she wrote it. But the difference here is that what Britney is giving us is her story. It is the story of her life that only she has lived. That is her story to tell. And that's what we're buying into when we buy her book. We are buying her story. The same happened recently with Paris Hilton's memoir, which I have to say, is really, really good. And yet when we open this book, there is no reference of a ghostwriter. I think that in the acknowledgements, there's one moment where she says about someone, Joni Rogers helped me find my voice and held my hand through the chaos. And again, someone helping you to find your voice often is kind of celebrity code for they helped me write this, but that's just speculation that is not confirmed. Paris Hilton, please don't sue me. I really loved your book. And so what a celebrity ghostwriter does when it comes to memoir writing and autobiography is they help the public figure that is the focus of the book is to translate their story onto the page in a compelling way with a structure and a format that is palatable for us as readers to consume. I think that's pretty reasonable. I think that's what we are all expecting. And as I mentioned, perhaps the biggest book of the year has also been written by a ghostwriter. So this is Prince Harry's book, which was ghostwritten by J.R. Moringer. Now, J.R. Moringer is like 
the most prolific celebrity ghostwriter. He wrote Shoe Dog for Phil Knight, the founder of Nike or Nike, and also Open by tennis star Andre Agassi. And actually, I think that they obviously used that book as the blueprint for this one, like even the way that they have that one word title and the kind of stare down the barrel of the camera is the same. Same ghostwriter, they were definitely trying to replicate the success of that book with Spare. I also think that Open is a genius title for a book about a tennis star because obviously you have like the US Open, the French Open, the Australian Open as a tennis term. But then also the double entendre of like it open, being open, being honest, being vulnerable. I love that. Anyway, so his next project was Spare. And Spare was, by all accounts, a huge triumph. It sold 3.2 million copies in its first week, and there was a huge media frenzy about this book. Interestingly, in an article for The New Yorker, Moringer actually said that he would write this book differently now that it's been published, because after the book was published and his name was leaked to the press, he was stalked by paparazzi, they followed him home, like tailgated his car when he was dropping his kid off at school. They would offer to pay his friends and family for like insider info, like it's insane. And after that experience of that side of the British press, he was like, actually I really empathize with Harry a lot more now, now that I've experienced what his life is like every single day. And the article he wrote for The New Yorker is very, very insightful. It explains the process of being incredibly collaborative. They actually had huge fights over how certain scenes were going to be portrayed in the book. They were going back and forth for months on editorial details, like this really feels like a partnership. He came and stayed in Harry's house, he met the family, he talks very highly of Meghan. This really feels like a collaboration, like something they came to do together. Harry had the story, Moringa wrote it down. And in the article he uses this analogy to talk about the art of ghostwriting. Our five-year-old daughter looked up from her cinnamon toast and asked, what is ghostwriting? My wife and I gazed each other as if she'd asked, what is God? Well, I said, drawing a blank. Okay, you know how you love art? She nodded. She loves few things more. An artist is what she hopes to be. Imagine if one of your classmates wanted to say something, express something, but they couldn't draw. Imagine if they asked you to draw a picture for them. I would do it, she said. That's ghostwriting. And he also agreed on the huge importance of celebrity books to the writing industry. I simply remind the callers that ghostwriting is an art and urge them not to let those who cast it as hacky, shady or faddish, it's been around for thousands of years, dim their pride. I also tell them that they're providing a vital public service, helping to shore up the publishing industry since most of the titles on this week's bestseller list were written by someone besides the named author. This happens all the time in celebrity memoir writing. Alex Haley wrote Malcolm X's autobiography. Ted Sorensen helped John F. Kennedy write his book, which he then won the Pulitzer Prize for. But they were incredibly honest and transparent. And I think that's what readers like because we're expecting it anyway. We kind of want those people to be celebrated and to be thanked. And maybe we will start to see more ghostwriter credits, specifically on the cover. I saw that Leanne Pinnock from Little Mix is releasing a book. She has also been releasing Bangers, by the way, her solo career is great. And she is putting her collaborator's name on the cover of her book. And I think this does feel more ethical. Straight away, it feels like that person is being credited for their storytelling. And I guess it recognizes how crucially important that person was in bringing this story to life. But ultimately, it's a commonly accepted practice. For us to hear stories by famous and influential people, a writer is brought in to make that story palatable and legible and ultimately enjoyable. There's a really interesting article called Ghosting, which is by Andrew O'Hagan, whose fiction is brilliant, by the way, but he's also a very talented essayist. And he worked with Julian Assange on a now scrapped autobiography about his career and WikiLeaks. And he got this fascinating insight into the life of Julian Assange. And Julian said he wanted to work with someone who didn't already know him so they could really capture the essence of his story from a fresh perspective. And Andrew O'Hagan has written extensively about how odd Julian Assange was to work with and how he was told he had to write the story on a computer that didn't have connection to the internet because they were so nervous that like the CIA were going to try and hack this computer. Overall, the fact of the matter is that no one really seems to get too mad when celebrity memoirs are ghostwritten. And so if we all know that ghostwriters are being used, do they need to be credited on covers or is it just implicit? Moringer says, that's the mystic paradox of ghostwriting. You're inherent and nowhere, vital and invisible. To borrow an image from William Gus, you're the heir in someone else's trumpet. And I think that's an interesting metaphor, like these two things cannot work without the other one, but both are important, the celebrity and the writer. And yet that feels slightly different when it comes to 
fiction. That feels like the ghostwriter is the trumpet and the air, and the celebrity author is more like the stage that that person is put on, and that person might actually be behind a curtain. I think it's different because the division of labor when it comes to fiction writing isn't as clear. With a memoir, we know that the author provides the story, the writer provides the writing, but in fiction, it's a creative endeavor, and those lines are blurred. With fiction, it's harder to know where the whole ideation process of the book came from, because like I say, the writer is also coming up with a lot of the plot and the characters and the details, which doesn't happen in memoir writing because it is all real. For a book tour of a celebrity memoir, I would only expect the celebrity to be there because it's their story that we are buying into. We're buying into their brand, but then with fiction writing, just seeing Millie Bobby Brown alone on the stage when she didn't do all of the work feels different somehow. So I think it's important to remember that fundamentally these are different arts, they're different crafts. Writing fiction uses a different writing muscle to writing memoir, says ghostwriter Shannon Kyle. In some instances, the celebrity will come up with a loose plot and the ghostwriter has to work around this. Involvement, I think, varies wildly depending on the celebrity. And Gillian Stern, who has written a number of celebrity memoirs, says if a ghostwriter sits with a blank page and doesn't have any input at all from the celebrity, I think that's ethically difficult. And that kind of brings us on to the big question. Is ghostwriting ethical? For me, looking at everything that we've discussed, I think that sometimes ghostwriters are necessary, if not crucial. Where the ethics come in, I think, is where they're celebrated and where they're acknowledged in the project. There's two sides to this, I think. One is, is it ethical for the writer? And like I said before, these people are paid to do these projects, they know what they're getting themselves in for. So I think that is fair, they know what to expect. It's more about really where it comes down to the reader and how much the reader is aware that what they're reading is ghostwritten. Forbes says, one thing that invites ghostwriting murkiness is that many people who believe they need a ghostwriter are in actuality looking for a skilled collaborator to help them create copy that does the most justice to their ideas and words. This, of course, is not a problem. The ethical breach is asking an imposter to create material and then pretending that it was written by the person who hired the ghostwriter. And Tina Lyons, who also helped found the ghostwriters agency, says that to answer the question of whether ghostwriting is ethical, you would have to look at the three parties involved, the ghost, the author, and the reader. From a ghost's point of view, this is a business transaction. They are selling their skills as a writer, so it is no different from any other business transaction. The same could also be said for the author. They've asked the ghost to write what they would have said if they had the time, skill, or patience to write it. The place where the lines might get a little blurred is when it comes to the reader. Most people know and accept that the majority of non-fiction is written with the help of ghosts. The genre of celebrity fiction is not so clear cut, and therefore readers won't be so aware of the collaboration. So I suppose we can hope that celebrity authors will be transparent about these collaborations. I think the future is having ghostwriters' names on the cover, but I guess some of the onus is on us too to be more vigilant with checking whether there is a collaborator before we go into buying a book so that we know what we are buying. The University of Oregon suggests that there are five ethical questions to ask about a ghostwritten project, which are, one, what is the audience's degree of awareness? Awareness. Two, does the communicator use a ghostwriter to make himself or herself appear to possess personal qualities that he or she does not really have? Three, what are the surrounding circumstances of the communicator's job that make ghostwriting a necessity? For example, are they busy acting on stage? Are they performing to hundreds of thousands of people every night? You know, do those people actually have time to sit down and write a book and give it the attention it deserves? Four, to what extent did the communicator actively participate in the writing of their own messages? So are the sentiments expressed their own? Five, does the communicator accept responsibility for the message he or she presents? I find that final point so interesting because I suppose if you sign off on the project and you put your name on it, you are now accepting responsibility for that project. You know, if there is problematic language, if there are things that people take offense to, your name is now on that. And if you're going to accept the glory and the money and the fame and the fortune that comes with it, you also have to accept the defeats and the low moments and the backlash too. I remember reading the Kendall and Kylie Jenner book and thinking that basically the bad guys are just ugly and poor. <laughs> like, that's their only crime. And the rich kids from the, like, upper regions of society come down and kill them. And I think, like, that problematic idea was not from their own brains, but they did put their names on the cover of it, and therefore they have to accept responsibility for the fact that that is the plot of their book. In the same way that when Kendall Jenner did that 
Pepsi advert where she like solves police brutality with a can of Pepsi. Like she didn't write that advert. She didn't come up with the concept, but she did star in it and she did co-sign it by signing off on that project. And so they do have to accept some level of accountability. Point two in that list, I think is the tricky one when it comes to fiction. The idea that people may get the impression that you possess qualities that you do not actually have because a ghostwriter presented them. I guess the quality that you are being credited with is being a good writer, which is actually what the ghostwriter did. Ghostwritten novels do suggest that the communicator, the celebrity, has a skill, a creative skill, that they do not possess. So look, it's a murky industry. There are complicated ethics surrounding ghostwritten books. And still a lot of questions. I hope that this video sort of helped to contextualize some of them and bring a few different discussion points to attention. And hopefully we can consume ghostwritten books even more mindfully kind of going forward. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your commentary in the comment section down below. Let me know what you think. Let me know if I missed anything or if there are any interesting case studies that you found and what your perspective is. I would love to hear and let's continue this conversation down below. If you're new here, you can subscribe, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. It's a bit of a different style for me, my video essay era, but I really enjoyed kind of doing all the research and deep diving into this thing that interests me so much. So thanks so much for watching. All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day and I will catch you next time. Bye-bye.